guys, what's up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Melody and today I am going to find out what my favorite book of 2022 was. And I'm going to do that via a bracket. So I made a handy dandy bracket here on my iPad. I will have it up on the screen right about now. So today I'm going to be filling this bracket out on camera and together we will discover what my favorite book of 2022 was. So let's get started. Here we go. First and foremost, I already have my 12, technically 14, but we'll get back to that. I already have my 12 candidates, I guess, on the bracket. In my bullet journal, I kept track of my monthly favorite and I used that to fill in this bracket. All right, so hopefully this is kind of clearer for you guys to see. So we're gonna start up by January and February. We have A Castle in the Clouds by Kirsten Gear versus Permanent Record by Mary H.K. Choi. Castle in the Clouds was a fabulous book. I thought it was so sweet, so fun. It's kind of a cozy mystery. It takes place in the most beautiful, gorgeous, stunning setting of maybe any book I've ever read. I don't know. It's set at a grand hotel set in the Swiss Alps. It is pure escapism. It is magical the perfect book to read in winter. And like I said, it's a really cute, cozy, kind of mystery romance book. I loved it, I had a great time. It was definitely my favorite in January. And my February favorite, Permanent Record. All right, so listen. Mary H.K. Choi is kind of a newer author for me. Permanent Record was the second book by her that I read and I absolutely fell in love with it. I listened to the audiobook of this book and it was the first audiobook that I ever just came home after work, plugged in my headphones, sat down and stared at the wall to finish reading the book, you know, audibly. So that says a lot. This book follows a boy named Pablo. He's from mixed backgrounds. I believe his father's family is from Pakistan and his mother's family is from North Korea or South Korea. I'm not sure. I can't remember which one, but anyway, Pablo is a young adult. I would say, I think he's like 22 or 23 in this book. He is a college dropout, I want to say, but he is basically swimming in debt. He has no idea how to get out of it. He's kind of angsty and frustrated and he makes a lot of mistakes and he takes out a lot of his fear and anger on the people around him. And it's very real life. And I just related to it so much because like the way he described how he dealt with his frustrations and his fears and how he was so scared to reach out for help. I just related to it so much, um, you know, probably because we're both in the same period of our life. I don't think everybody would love this book. I think a lot of older people would find Pablo annoying or ungrateful or stubborn or what have you. but. I just related to it so much being a young 20 something trying to figure out this adulting life. It is just beautiful. It is also a romance. <laughs> um, I guess a big part of this book is a romance. Pablo actually meets a movie star and they have a whirlwind romance that's chaotic and crazy and lavish, but also kept very secret and it is crazy wild and such a fun time, but it is not very healthy either. It is amazing. I just love that book so much. <laughs> anyway, I need to shut up about Permanent Record. Um, between these two, I think it's kind of obvious based on how much I've prattled on about Permanent Record that I'm going to move Permanent Record on to the next round. Now we have One Italian Summer versus Lizzie and Dante. Both of these books are set in Italy. So obviously I'm in love with the setting for both of them. If you're new here, I love Italy. I love reading books about Italy. It is my favorite place in the whole world. So, <sighs> One Italian Summer is about a woman who recently lost her mother. They were very, very close. And basically the main character is on a journey of rediscovering herself without her mom, kind of questioning what her life has been up until this point, if she wants to continue the, her life the way it has been so far. And she ends up going on a solo trip to Positano. She actually runs into her mom. Her recently passed away mother is there, but her mom is in her 30s, so the same age as her daughter. 
So the main character kind of gets to meet her mom before she was her mom. And it's beautiful. It is heart-wrenching. Oh, it is such a wonderful, wonderful story. I had a great time with it. And then Lizzie and Dante is a real tearjerker. We're following a woman who has cancer and she goes to Elba Island and meets and falls in love with an Italian chef. And it's all about her deciding whether or not she should choose to love somebody at this stage in her life. And it is just gutting. So, but, uh, but so, so beautiful, just incredibly beautiful. I loved both of these books. However, I gave Lizzie and Dante four stars and I gave One Italian Summer five stars. So, Let's move one Italian summer. Next, we have Love and Gelato versus the Star-Crossed Sisters of Tuscany. Again, <laughs> both, both of these books are also set in Italy. I went through a whole Italy book phase this time last year because I went on vacation to Italy. Anyway, <laughs> so Love and Gelato is actually a reread for me. It's about a girl who also just lost her mom, but she's a high schooler. So she's forced to go live in Florence and, you know, possibly attend high school there. And she's dealing with grief and she's also trying to figure out who her dad is. And along the way, she makes new friends. It's just so sweet, so cute. I love it. It's kind of a comfort read for me. And then we have the Star-Crossed Sisters of Tuscany. We have an Italian-American family in this story. And supposedly the second daughters in this family are all cursed. They cannot find love. So in this book, we're following a couple of different second daughters. Our main character is a second daughter and she and her cousin, who is also a second daughter, go on a trip to Italy with their great aunt, who, let's hear it, is also a second daughter. So they're all three supposedly cursed and they go to Italy to try to break the curse. It is amazing and it's beautiful. There's so many characters in this book. This family has so much depth. There are chapters where we go back in time and we get the backstory of the great aunt and what her youth was like. It's just great. I loved going back and forth. It was heart-wrenching, a tearjerker, beautiful, loved it. <sighs> so I'm going to say that Starcross Sisters of Tuscany is going forward and I'm picking that one because Love and Gelato was a reread. I don't necessarily need to move that book forward because, you know, Love and Gelato will always be a favorite. It doesn't need to win my favorite of 2022, if that makes sense. July versus August, we have Howl's Moving Castle versus Heartstopper Volume 2. Howl's Moving Castle, I won't stay here long. I feel like a lot of people know this story or have seen the movie. Um, we're following Sophie, and she goes on a crazy magical adventure with a evil wizard named Howl. He has a moving castle. There's a fire demon. It is a classic fantasy, very cozy fantasy. Sophie is determined to break the curse between Calcifer, the fire demon, and Howl, the wizard. It's also a love story. It's great. Then we have Heartstopper Volume 2. Again, I feel like a lot of people know what these books are about. But this is the second installment in the series, and I just felt really connected to the characters in this one. After reading the first one and getting kind of acquainted, I I just feel like my feelings were a lot stronger in reading the second volume and it made me giddy and I really liked it. I do think overall though, I have more of an emotional connection to Howl's Moving Castle still, which I know I just said that, I know I just said previously that I don't necessarily want to move any rereads on very far in this bracket and Howl's Moving Castle is a reread, but I have to be honest, like it's, it holds a higher place in my heart than Heartstopper Volume 2. So I'm gonna move on Howl's Moving Castle, just for now. All right, September versus October, we have The Death of Jane Lawrence by Caitlin Starling versus The Last Time I Lied by Riley Sager. I gave both of these books five stars, but they're both pretty different, I would say. I love them for different reasons. So the last time I lied was just enjoyable. Like point blank, I enjoyed it. It was easy to read, easy to follow. It was suspenseful. I think I listened to this audiobook all in one day. I was just so hooked. I wanted to solve the mystery. I wanted to know what happened 
to these three girls that disappeared, what was it, 10 years ago at summer camp. The reason I gave this book five stars was because the ending truly shocked me. My jaw hit the floor. I didn't see it coming. Right when I thought I knew how the book ended and it was being wrapped up, Riley Sager came in with a curveball. I was shocked. It was amazing. I loved that feeling of being totally surprised and that's why I gave it five stars. Now, The Death of Jane Lawrence was a totally different ball game. This book is really complex, I would say. Um, it takes place in, I think, the 1800s England? I'm not sure. Just think very gothic, dark academia vibes, maybe. At the beginning of the book, Jane marries Augustine Lawrence. It's a marriage of convenience. And Augustine's only deal in this marriage is that Jane is not allowed to stay at his house, Lindridge Hall. That's his only rule, but that rule is soon broken. Lindridge Hall is not what it seems. It's very dark and mysterious and creepy. Is it haunted? Is it not? It's one giant mystery where we don't know if our narrator is reliable or not. We don't know if Jane is spiraling into madness. We don't know if ghosts are real. We don't know if witchcraft is real. It is insane. It is such a wild ride. It's not for everybody, I wouldn't say. You really have to let go of all control when you go into this book to truly enjoy it. I do think the death of Jane Lawrence is just a little bit more genius, a little bit more sophisticated, a tougher nut to crack than the last time I lied. And because of that, I'm gonna move it on. Now we have November versus December. In my bullet journal, my favorite for November was A Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Jackson. And my favorite for December was So This Is Christmas by Jenny Holiday. I'm not gonna stay here long. I just talked about So This Is Christmas in my December wrap up. It's a really cute holiday romance, think, a Hallmark movie, but better. I gave that book four stars. A Good Girl's Guide to Murder is wildly popular. It's an amazing, amazing audiobook. Highly recommend it. Fully immersive experience. I gave that one five stars. So I'm moving A Good Girl's Guide to Murder on. There's a high school boy named Sal Singh who was accused of murdering Andrea Bell, and then he kills himself. However, our main character Pippa does not believe that Sal was guilty, so she goes off on her own quest to prove Sal innocent. It's fascinating. I loved it. It was so much fun. It's just a really good, well-done YA mystery thriller. Is it a thriller? I don't know. I think it's more of a mystery. Anyway, that one's moving on. So now we have two wild card books that were kind of thrown in here to make this bracket work. We have one right here and we have one right down here. So let's start up top. This is You Should See Me in a Crown by Leah Johnson. I read this book in January of last year. It is another book in the month of January that I gave five stars. So I thought that would be perfect to be a wild card candidate. This is such a sweet lovely young adult romance book. It's a young adult sapphic romance, actually. Um, we're following our main character, uh, Lighty. What's her name? Liz Lighty, I think. Her last name's Lighty. I remember that. Um, but anyway, she's on a mission to go to college and she really needs a scholarship to get into the college that she wants to go to. But in order to get the scholarship that she needs, she must run for homecoming queen. And she's the last sort of student that would normally run for homecoming queen, but she does it. It is so sweet, so heartwarming. I really like this book. It's one of those books that just makes you smile the whole time you're reading it. So we have that book versus the Starcrossed Sisters of Tuscany. I know I just raved about You Should See Me in a Crown. I love that book, but the thing about Sisters of Tuscany is that book made me cry. It made me cry as well as laugh, as well as smile. So I think it just gave me a wider range of emotions than the YA romance did. So I, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. Now let's scooch back down to our November, December winner. 
the wild card against A Good Girl's Guide to Murder is actually the third book in that same trilogy, As Good as Dead. So here's the deal. <laughs> I totally forgot that I read this book in December because I ended up writing that summary in November's part of my bullet journal. It definitely, definitely got more stars than So This Is Christmas, but again, I forgot. So I put the Christmas book as the winner, even though technically I liked As Good As Dead more. So it ended up being the perfect book for the wild card slot. Um, I gave As Good As Dead five stars. <sighs> so basically we have the first book in a trilogy versus the third book in a trilogy. This is the showdown of the century. <laughs> Typically, I love a good origin story. Usually the first book or the first movie is always my favorite. However, the thing about As Good As Dead is that that was the most wild ride <laughs> I think I've ever had when it came to sort of a murder mystery book. I've never read one from this point of view before. I'm sure there's plenty of books out there similar to this one but I, I just personally haven't read any of them. I can't say much about this book, but the main character, Pippa, in As Good As Dead, she makes a very risky decision in that book, and the rest of the book is her having to deal with that decision. It's wild. I, I can't say enough about how crazy it was. I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. So you know what? I'm gonna say that that one is a little bit better than the first one. I'm moving as good as dead on to the next round. I just really liked it. It was just crazy. I would say it's definitely far-fetched, probably even more than the first book, but that's what I liked about it. It was wild. All right, looking at the board now, I'm definitely gonna jump down here to this battle, Howl's Moving Castle versus The Death of Jane Lawrence. This is where I'm going to say a reread is not going to move on. <laughs> uh, Death of Jane Lawrence. It was just a book I won't forget anytime soon. I don't think I mentioned the setting earlier, but the setting of this book was immaculate. I felt like I was Jane and I was in Lindridge Hall. It was just a whole immersive experience. Unlike any book I think I've ever read or listened to before, it was just beautiful. Incredible, I loved it. Uh, Caitlin Starling did a great job with that setting and making it so spooky and perfect to read in the fall. Ugh, it was just, it was wonderful. So I'm moving that book on. <sighs> so we have one more quarterfinal round. Uh, permanent Record versus One Italian Summer. However, that matchup is so neck and neck and I'm being, I'm just being honest. That is such a tight race between those two books that I'm gonna skip it. I'm gonna get back to that later. So yeah, um, let's go ahead and do The Death of Jane Lawrence versus As Good As Dead. So I was just talking about how impeccable the setting was in Jane Lawrence and in Holly Jackson's world, that she made for this trilogy, it's nothing to write home about. It's just a small town in America. There's nothing super atmospheric about it. There's nothing super spooky about it, which is, you know, part of what makes it interesting because it's just your typical small town. Why are there so many murders going on in it? Like that's, that's the whole point. But I'm kind of a setting gal. I'll just admit that right now. I might be biased to books if I like the setting because I think more than anything, I read books to escape, you know? And so I give settings a lot, a lot of power, a lot of merit. That being said, The Death of Jane Lawrence had an impeccable setting and that's gonna move her on to the semifinals. <laughs> All right, so listen. Permanent Record and One Italian Summer. In the back of my mind, I knew th that these two books were going to be in my top three this year. I really did. And it is a shame that they're having to face off so early in the bracket because if they had been, you know, on opposite sides of the bracket, they both would have been in the semifinal round. I know that. But unfortunately, 
they are facing off in the second round. So I'm just gonna be honest with you guys. <laughs> this sucks a little bit, like uh, it kind of ruins the video, but I have to be honest. Whoever wins between Permanent Record and One Italian Summer is going to win the whole thing. I already know that because I love both of those books so much. I think that the Star-Crossed Sisters of Tuscany versus Death of Jane Lawrence, Lawrence would lose. My love for the settings in both books were very comparable. However, Italy is sort of my obsession and Star-Crossed Sisters gave me a very wide range of emotions throughout, whereas Jane Lawrence was, you know, kind of a thriller. I was thrilled, but you know, other than that, it didn't go much deeper. The other book was pretty deep. I felt more things throughout the book. So Star-Crossed would beat Death of Jane Lawrence. Basically, if I'm being honest, I know it's going to be between the Starcross Sisters of Tuscany versus whoever wins between Permanent Record and One Italian Summer. And I already kind of know in my heart of hearts that I like both of those books more than Starcrossed. I do. So I'm going to clean this up. We're going to focus on this battle here, this epic battle. I already know whoever wins this is going all the way. This one is probably the hardest one because honestly, I love these books for two very different reasons. Like I said before, I had such a personal connection to Permanent Record and just how me and Pablo are in very similar stages in life. Um, this struggle into finding our footing in adulthood is just so raw and it hit close to home. That's the thing about Permanent Record. It hit so close to home. Mm, I don't know. Okay. It just gives me so many feelings. That book was just so deep and personal to me and heartbreaking. But so was One Italian Summer. I think I cried more in One Italian Summer than I did in Permanent Record. However, the author of One Italian Summer, Rebecca, she does an amazing job of the setting. Gosh dang it. <laughs> We're back to my obsession with settings. She just, uh, she paints the picture of Positano so beautifully. It is like completely being transported to that wonderful, beautiful, magical place when you read this book. It is truly like you're there. Listen, okay, listen. I have a couple of things to say about this book. A, there is something magical about finding yourself in Italy. No matter where in Italy, it is such a unique, culturally vibrant country. It's just an incredible place to find yourself again. And I do have some experience with kind of finding yourself and learning who you are in Italy. I have some experience with that. So I think that's how I connected to this book in a personal way. <sighs> just knowing how magical Italy can be and how it can just transform a person, truly. If, if you let it, if you allow it to, if you embrace it, Italy can be transformative. And that's how I relate to that book personally. And also another thing, like I said earlier in this video, my boyfriend and I went on vacation to Italy this past summer. It was his first time in Italy. My gosh, I don't know, fourth or fifth time. Italy is definitely the country I've been to the most you know, outside of the United States. I lived in Florence for four months in college. So yeah, anyway, what was I saying? <laughs> we went on vacation and we went to Positano and I was actually able to visit the hotel that the main character stays at in this book. It is a true real life hotel. It's called Hotel Poseidon. I'll put some pictures up of me visiting this hotel on our trip. We were even able to eat at the restaurant there and enjoy the beautiful views, the same views that the main character in the book enjoys. And I think having that personal connection as well to this story is going to push One Italian Summer on to the next round. It is, it is something I haven't been able to replicate with any other book I've ever read just the amount of personal connection I have to it. And because of that, One Italian Summer beats Starcross Sisters of Tuscany. And hands down, it's going to beat The Death of Jane Lawrence as well. 
one Italian summer, takes it all the way, and is the winner of my 2022 best book of the year bracket. Cue the applause. It is so wonderful to finally complete this bracket and be able to tell you what my favorite book of the year was. You know, for a minute there, I thought it was going to be permanent record. And then <laughs> as I was kind of talking through it for this video, I realized how much of a personal connection I actually do have with One Italian Summer. Let me just get the winner down from my shelf right now. I also love the cover. That helps a lot. <laughs> This is the winner right here in all of her glory. I love this book. I highly recommend it to everybody. Will everyone have the same personal connection to this book that I do? I don't know, probably not. I can imagine other people relating to this book in different ways than I did. It's short, it's not too long. It is so sweet, it is so beautiful, breathtaking. A journey of self-discovery, a journey of finding love again. I think it looks like a romance from the outside, but I definitely wouldn't call it that. It is something much deeper than that. It's incredible. It's my favorite book of 2022. All right, I need to shut up now. <laughs> Thank you so much for going on this journey with me to find my favorite book of 2022. I hope you guys like this video. I hope you guys maybe check this book out sometime if you want. I highly recommend it. I hope you're having a good day. Subscribe to my channel if you feel so inclined. And I hope to see you in the next one. Ciao.